And we have the pleasure, those of us who are remaining here in the gym, of listening in as Scott McIntyre shares with us from your heart. We'll turn it over to you at this time, Scott. And Scott is going to stay on the lower level, so the camera is just going to come down and zoom in on him. Because Scott might be or might not be afraid of heights, but we'll just leave that one up. <laughs> I'll leave that with you to decide. Bear with me while I get life organized up here. Everybody well today? Good to see some smiling faces. Nice to be back with you. All right. If you have a Bible with you or you want to, uh, if you find your Bible on your screen or your tablet or your, I don't know if you've got it written on your arm or where you have your Bible these days, but if you want to turn to the book of Hebrews, we'll get there uh, momentarily. Maybe not right away, but we will get there at some point, I do promise you. Hebrews chapter 9 is where we'll get to eventually. I like to set this up at a certain distance from my face. I was uh, on vacation last summer for a little while with my family, and one morning my little four-year-old son came running into the living room. He wanted me to read something for him, and he brought the book or the sheet of paper, whatever he had, and he jammed it right in my face, and my eyes went, and immediately I had a 20-second headache. I'm like, what's going on? That's not supposed to hurt. And a few weeks ago, or a few weeks later, I'd I had previously booked an optometrist, that's a fun word to say, optometrist appointment, not because of what happened there, it was already booked before the vacation, but I remembered that incident when I was at the optometrist's office, so I, I said to her, I said, this is what happened a few weeks ago with my son wanting me to read something. She, he put it right in my face and my eyes tried to focus and my head started to hurt. And she laughed at me. And she said, here's the diagnosis, you're over 40. Like, oh, thanks a lot. Yeah, I didn't do anything to deserve that, but that was the, the, the medical reasoning behind it all. You hit, the, you hit the right spot on the calendar, good luck, essentially, is what I was told, right? <laughs> Maybe not quite that case. But anyways, great to be with you this morning. Father, thank you for Hope Fellowship, this community of believers today. Thank you for our opportunity to share together in song and in looking at your scriptures together. Help us, Holy Spirit, we pray with understanding and insight and reminder of your love and your favor and your compassion. We thank you, Jesus, for who you are and all you've given for all the world. And as we set our attention on your word for a few moments here today, we thank you for your guidance, for your help, for your peace. We give you thanks for who you are and all you've done. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I understand just from speaking with Pastor Mike in, in recent weeks, You've been talking about a few different things in recent months, but he did tell me that you were talking a little bit about who is God. It's a big subject. I'm going to leave that with Mike. That's too big for me, right? But I can, I can maybe brush on a few facets of that, but out of that conversation when he says, who is God? Well, to me, in reading the New Testament, if I want to know what God is like, Jesus said to his followers, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what he said. So if you're going to ask me, who is God? Well, we know Father, we know Holy Spirit. I'm also going to say, well, Jesus. Jesus is God. So if I'm going to relate to God, I'm going to start with him, because it's going to sound a little bit funny, but in my limited language, it's the only way I can think of is Jesus is the one who's most like me. He, he's, he's one of us. I can relate to him. I can relate to the Holy Spirit as I learn to do so. I can relate to the Father because I've, 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 been, I've been fortunate in life. I, I have a good Father. Not just God my Father, but my natural Father. I wish every person on the planet could say that, and unfortunately they can't. I didn't do anything to deserve it, but I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful that my natural Father is a reflection of my heavenly Father. Amen to that. But for today, I'm, I'm going to go to Jesus. Who is God? Well, Jesus is God. God is Jesus. God is Holy Spirit. God is Father. Blah, my mind is blown. But I'm going to stick with Jesus. Who is he? Well, some people across the broad spectrum of humanity would say he's a Jewish rabbi. Fair enough. I can live with that. 
He fit in with the system of the rabbi in his days. He was called rabbi. His disciple, he said to his disciples one day, he said, you call me rabbi and you speak right for I'm, I'm your teacher. You're not, you're not wrong. He's not limited to that, but yeah. Now, coming from backgrounds like maybe you and I share or for however long you've been a believer in Christ or maybe you've been in it for many years or just a few weeks, I don't know. But we know Jesus as Savior. We know him as Son of God. We know him as, you know, in, in some of the more medical, metaphorical versions we hear in the Scriptures, we might call him the Good Shepherd. He called himself the Good Shepherd. He called himself the Door of the Sheep. He called himself a number of different things, the light of the world, all of these different metaphorical references to Jesus. But there's just one I'd, I want to kind of emphasize today, just one. Now, let me share a little illustration. Oh, there it is right there. How many of you remember back to elementary school or high school? I remember my friends and I, we would go into school after the bell rang. I'm thinking of maybe grade five, grade six, somewhere in there. And we'd go to our lockers and hang up our coats, hang up our backpacks, get our books for the day, and, and head to the classroom. How many of you are tracking with me on this particular experience? And you get to the door of the classroom and you stop. Who dat? <laughs> the substitute teacher. Anybody tracking with my, sympathize with my affliction or maybe my joy? I don't know, right? The substitute teacher. How many of you still feel guilty for what you and your classmates did to the substitute teacher? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, thank you. We, there's some honesty in the room. That's fair. I hope it wasn't a reptile, maybe just limited to spitballs or I don't know what. Some of you are shaking your head like that poor individual. Lord, have mercy on their soul. I remember in grade five, we got into the classroom, of course, being in grade five, 10, 11, 12, I forget how old I was in grade five. It was three years, so I was 12, 13, and 14, but no, just kidding. But one substitute teacher we had, I remember Mr. Howe, and the noise in the classroom as the day was beginning, the man did not say a word. He went to the blackboard and ran his fingernails down it. And instantly, we all wanted to die. <laughs> the substitute teacher. Thank God for substitute teachers. Lord, have mercy on them, as we said. What was the point of the substitute teacher? Well, the regular teacher was away. So the objective or the goal or the purpose of the substitute teacher was to do what the regular teacher would do. In a perfect world, that would have been successful. But my grade five class wasn't a perfect world for the substitute teacher. Ideally, here's the thought line. In the perfect world, when the regular teacher came back, he or she would not have to teach again what the substitute teacher taught. No perfect world for the regular teacher either. Do you remember how unproductive substitute teacher days could be when you were in school? Well, ideally when the regular teacher came back, the material covered by the substitute teacher was well covered, well received by the students, and the regular teacher can go on with the lesson plan. Perfect world. Not perfect world. There was a substitute. We're not just talking about teachers today. We're talking about Jesus today. He is our perfect substitute. He's our perfect substitute. What do we mean by that? What he has done and what he is doing today are because we couldn't do them for ourselves. We couldn't do it. What he has done, what he is doing today, he was our substitute because there were some things we couldn't do for ourselves. Now here's the other side of it as well, or the continuation of it. Because of what he has done, and because of what he is doing today, we don't need to try to do those things for ourselves. We can't anyways. 
He is the perfect substitute. Whether this substitute teacher was successful in teaching the lesson or not, we don't know. But we know that our perfect substitute, he has been, he is today, and he ever will be successful in his role as our substitute. Amen. I think we're off to a pretty good start. We doing okay? Maybe you've read uh, something like Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own ways. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What happened to him was for us. If he did it for us and he's perfect, it's perfectly done. I don't do it for myself. Are we okay so far? Now, we've heard that before. We, we, we've heard about the past before, and we need to be reminded frequently of the past because I'm a good forgetter. So please, as time goes on, remind me of what he did. I'm glad to hear about it over and over and over and over again. But there's something that Jesus is yet doing today. Are you in the book of Hebrews on your phone or on your arm or wherever you've got it? Hebrews chapter 9. Let's read a few verses there. Hebrews chapter 9, starting at verse 24. It says this, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true. When he's writing to the Hebrews years ago, he's talking about the temple. He's referring back to the tabernacle of the Old Testament, the temple of the Old Testament, which is still there when he's writing today. But he says, these things are copies. He says, Christ has not entered these holy places that were made with human hands. Christ has entered the true. He doesn't enter into the copy. He enters into the true place, into heaven itself. Catch the end of verse 24. He is there now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should suffer often himself, as the high priest enters the most, pla most holy place every year with blood of another, Jesus then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Let's go back to the end of verse 24 for a moment. Remember what the substitute teacher did? The substitute teacher taught the lesson for the regular teacher, in place of, on behalf of. Jesus went to the cross on behalf of humanity. He went into death on behalf of humanity. He was resurrected on behalf of humanity. He went into heaven on behalf of humanity for us. Now what does it say here? He appears in the presence of God for us. He is our perfect substitute in the presence of God. Amen. I'll say that. I don't know if you want to say that yet. You want to keep listening before you decide whether or not, but I'm going to say amen. amen. He is there in the presence of God for us. Now let me give you a big mouthful and then dig myself out of the hole that I'm going to dig, okay? Because he is there for you, your appearance there is every bit as good as his. Should I say that again? Because he's there for you, your appearance there is every bit as good as his. Did we catch that here in the auditorium? How about in the world of the internet? Did you catch that one? Because he's there for you, your appearance there is every bit as good as his. Now let me still your troubled heart for a second. Oh, that sounds horribly arrogant and prideful. It could, but it isn't. Because you or I better never dare to take credit for it. I'm gonna say amen to that one too. Amen. It would be horribly proud and horribly arrogant if I decided to take credit for it. I'm not gonna to touch that one. He's there for me. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
It's the love of God that set it all up. And he's there in the presence of God for me. That's better than if I'm there for myself. (laughs) He is there on my behalf. He's there in the presence of God for me, for you. Our appearance is as good as his because that's what he's there for. Here's where it gets kind of troublesome. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say things like this? Without holiness, no one will see God. Yeah, it's in there. It's between the covers. It's in there in black. It's not in red, but it's in there in black, so that counts just as much. Don't let your red letter edition distract you. If it's in black, it's just as, just as credible as in red. Without holiness, no one will see God. Well, if it's up to me, is it going to happen? Nope. I'm a baseball player, or I was in years gone by. Strike one, strike two, strike three. You could give me 50 million strikes, and I'd use them all up. It's not going to happen. But it says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Not going to happen. But wait a minute. There is one who went to appear in the presence of God for us. And he appears there in his holiness. I'm going to say amen again. He's there with his holiness on my behalf. Wow. Well, wait a minute. The Bible also says this, and this was Jesus. If you've got the red letter edition, this one's in red letters. He's, he's speaking one day to the people around him, uh, to, to probably some Jewish people and maybe some Gentile people of the time, and they might be sitting by the lake on a nice sunny day. I don't know what it was like. But he looks at the people and he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Who were the scribes and the Pharisees? They were the best at the do's and the don'ts. There were other times when Jesus said, yeah, what the Pharisees tell you, do it. But he said, don't have the same attitude about it. But on this particular day, he said, unless you're doing better than them, you're not going to make it. And the honest person of the day would have to look at the Pharisee and begrudgingly say, yeah, he's tackling the list better than I am. And Jesus says, whoever the best of them is, still not enough. If your righteousness is not better, you don't get in. Strike one, strike two, strike three, it's all there again. But wait a minute. Somebody has gone into the presence of God there to appear for us. And he is called in other portions of the New Testament, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's there with his righteousness appearing for you. Holiness is there for you. Righteousness is there for you. The blessing of God is granted to you. Whatever good thing you would need in the presence of God, he represents it there for you. Amen. I set my attention on Jesus. I'll set my attention on my substitute. He is there in my place. He has gone to appear in the presence of God for us. Righteousness is given to me. The book of Romans refers to it as a gift of righteousness. Holiness is established for me. The Scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that God gave Christ to humanity as righteousness. It's all found in Him. Jesus, our Savior. Jesus, our righteousness. Jesus, our sanctification or our holiness. All found in Jesus. If you can flip quickly to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's do one more little portion from the book here today. Ephesians chapter 2. Everybody okay so far? We're all right? Everybody smiling? (laughs) Ephesians chapter 2. Let's have verse uh, 4 through 7. Oh, this is a good one. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. 
By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ. Boy, that's quite a set of verses there. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love, And why? That forever still to come, he might show us his kindness. What does he say? He raised us up together with Christ and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He is gone to appear in the presence of God for us. My appearance is there. Your appearance is there. It's him on our behalf. Is there any flaw in Jesus? Oh, I'm going to dig a deep hole here. Should I do it? Yeah, I'll do it anyways. Is there any shortcoming in Jesus? No. If God looks at the person of Jesus Christ, would he find any reason to reject him? No. There's no flaw in him. There's no fault in him. He's all good. Now, we can all applaud that and say amen, because we would never dare point out a fault in Jesus, because we can't find any. But here's the backside of the same coin. In Jesus, there is no room for improvement, because he's already perfect. Oh, some of you are like, I don't know how this is all going to add up. So in the presence of God and His appearance, there's no need for improvement of His appearance, and there's nothing lacking in His appearance, and He's there for you. Finish the story about yourself. Oh, you can't do it because it's a little bit hard to compute. Anytime I think of myself in relation to Jesus, well, I got some years behind me. I got some missteps behind me. I got some words I wish I could take back behind me, and I have some thoughts I wish I never thunk, and I have some experiences I wish I never had, and I had some relationships that I wish maybe didn't go the way they did, and I have some lost loved ones that I wish were still here, and I keep reading about the mercy and the grace and the kindness, and and I go, and sometimes your mind box at it. Can anybody sympathize with my affliction? We got it here? Okay. Okay, we got to go back to the classroom for some help then. Why? Because we have a mirror, and we have a memory of the past, and when we say, I am righteous, and when we say, I am holy, the mirror doesn't always agree. And 20 minutes ago doesn't always agree. And 20 years ago might not agree. But I think Jesus agrees. Because he would say, that's the whole reason I became who I am. The reason why the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, according to John chapter 1, is that He he could then go and appear there for us. Well, i got to say amen again. But sometimes my brain needs help. All right, some of you are about to have a nightmare, and this flashback is going to give you a panic attack, but we're going to do it anyways. Next screen, please. Solve it. I give you 45 seconds and I will sing the whole time. <laughs> that Bible that you're reading also has a calculator if you scroll to the right and push the button. <laughs> Anybody got it? Two and a half? Two. Two. Oh Lord, the substitute teacher failed again. Anybody got it? It's three. It's three. There you go. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> Triple check the double. Yeah, you got to square the hypotenuse and divide. No, no. Do you remember how you have to go about solving these? What did you have to do? What did you have to do? Ah. So you're going to have... Hey, now, how many of you work in construction, or you have worked in construction, or something? you're a house builder, or for your, your job involves using a tape measure a lot, or taking measurements? You, you might be able to do this in your head faster than some other people, just because you remember, well, three quarters plus a half is one and a quarter, and then, but the sixteenths are going to make you think, right? 
I can, I can know that a quarter plus an eighth is three eighths, and, but, but, but the sixteens kind of. But you remember, whether from your regular teacher or your substitute teacher, that you're going to have to make the half, the three quarter, and the seven eighths relate to the fourteen sixteenths. Or we're far enough along now that we know we could just divide the 14 by 2 and relate everything to 8. We could do that too. But the way we had to solve it was to find something common about all of them. Relate them all to 16, and then you can add up the top numbers and divide them. Some of you are still seeing red ink on your math test, and it's driving you crazy. <laughs> but you can solve it by making 16 or 8 the common denominator. Or the, I, I'll say it this way, if you make 16 or 8 the point of reference, you can figure it out. What do we do when we look in the mirror? We believe that Christ is righteous on our behalf, but the mirror doesn't always speak to me of righteousness. My memories of the past doesn't always speak to me of righteousness, doesn't always speak to me of holiness. But here's the thing, I'm not the point of reference. I'm not the common denominator. He is. So I'll take myself out of the equation. I'll make him the common point of everything. If there's going to be righteousness for me, it's going to have to come from him. If there's going to be holiness credited to me, it's going to have to come from him. And the good news of the Scripture says it's already come from him. It's already there for you. It's already attributed to you, even though you didn't carry that attribute yourself. It was given to you in Him. Didn't another portion of the New Testament also say things like this? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Didn't that passage say, old things have passed away and all things have become new? Didn't it say, now all things are of God? If all things are of 16, I can make it work. If all things are of God, if righteousness is of God, if holiness is of God, then it's going to have to come from Him, not from me. Well, what happened? Jesus was given to the world. Righteousness for you, holiness for me, there in the presence of God for us. What's left for us to do? Well, I, I would suggest we should probably be thankful. <laughs> we should probably say a good amen. So be it, Lord. So it is. I'll take that as my own. I say, well, here comes that pride again. No, 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 no. We don't dare take credit for it, but we can sure be thankful for it. We don't say, yeah, I deserve it, not a chance. But we will say, Christ has established these things for me. Christ is righteousness on my behalf. He is holiness on my behalf. I will take him as mine. And what he is on my behalf counts for me as much as for anybody else. He's there appearing in the presence of God on my behalf. Don't touch the credit, but be glad to receive the benefit that he's given. I'll finish just by reading one more, that, that portion from Ephesians again. God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He's the point of reference. I'm the beneficiary, not the one who made it happen. But I'm glad to say, thank you, Lord, for who you are, what you've done, who I am because of you. And even as, our, as the last song we sang, finished, I, I forget what the last sentence was, it says, what you've received of him, let somebody else know about it. 
Grace is given to me, and it works through me. The love of God is given to me. It works through me. So that those things that we look in the past and say, ah, we can avoid those traps in the future. You won't avoid them all. But that doesn't change His appearance on your behalf. So I'll take who He is on my behalf. I'll be thankful for it. And with His help, I'll live accordingly. Everybody all right today? No panic on the faces anymore. That's good. The math test is over. (laughs) He's there in the presence of God for us. All is well between God and us. And all can be well and continue to be well. We'll set our attention on Him. We'll shape our lives according to what we know of the one who is there on our behalf in the presence of God. Father, thank you for your great grace. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your mercy, for your compassion. Thank you that it was your love, O God, that put everything together, that you, Lord Jesus, are the expression of God's love, the manifestation of his grace. Thank you that your appearance is perfect on our behalf. Thank you that, as your word says, we are accepted in the beloved, and it's all because the Father first loved the world and has given you on our behalf. Thank you, O Savior, for who you are today. Father, for every household represented here, I thank you. And every day would be a day you would help us to be mindful of Christ and shape our lives according to what we know to be true of you and true of ourselves because of who you are and what you have done. We thank you, O Savior, that that is who you are, our Savior, having done on our behalf what we couldn't do for ourselves and doing for us today that which is not of us, righteousness, holiness, every good thing granted to us in you. We thank you in Jesus' name for good days yet to come, for good days gone by, looking ahead with joy and hope in the knowledge of your love and grace. It's in your name we pray together, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.